Welcome back. Happy March 26, 2021. I spoke yesterday about the need to teach heroism to our children. Plato in his book, The Republic, writes, Shall we just carelessly allow children to hear any casual tales which may be devised by casual persons and to receive into their minds ideas for the most part the very opposite of those which we should wish them to have when they are grown up? We cannot. Anything received into the mind at that age is likely to become indelible and unalterable. And therefore, it is most important that the tales which the young first hear should be models of virtuous thought. Then will our youth dwell in a land of health amid fair sights and sounds and receive the good in everything and beauty. The effluence of fair works shall flow into the eye and ear like a healthy giving breeze from a pure region and indelibly draw the soul from the earliest years into likeness and sympathy with the beauty of reason. There is no nobler training than that. But today, our children are not given health-giving breezes from the pure. They are not given beauty of reason. They are given instruction on transgenderism in kindergarten. They are given lessons on racial superiority and inferiority as toddlers younger than that. And they are given encomiums to Karl Marx as adolescents through Teen Vogue. The Cartoon Network colligates and gives them all of this. We've changed childhood in order to change our politics and our culture. We've disappeared childhood, and in the process, ironically, arrested all of our collective development. The one thing, the one thing adults can learn from children is purity of heart and soul, especially when it comes to such things as racial judgment, and we're now killing that off too, making sure children are race conscious. We are thus making a country and culture of race conscious men and women children man-child and women-child. So it seems to me, what I was mentioning yesterday, that is a general focus on incidents that provide teachable moments, we start with tragedies, but we miss the teachable moment. Why do we focus so much on the perpetrators of tragedies, be they assassins in Boulder or Atlanta or Minneapolis or elsewhere? Why not the heroes? There are always heroes. After all, just as there are always helpers in every situation, I'm consumed with the story, such as it is of Eric Talley, the police officer who was the first on the scene in Boulder. He was a 10-year police veteran dying at the age of 51. Is there no curiosity as to what made him want at age 41 to join the police force? He's a father of seven. No curiosity about any of that heroism? Could our children not learn something important about his life and life story? Well, perhaps in a better time, when we weren't talking about frying police like bacon, perhaps. But it seems to me those who emblemize those sentiments, like too many professional and multimillionaire athletes, are seen as more heroic in our culture today. The culture pays more attention to them than it ever would to an Eric Talley, perversely. David Dorn, a retired police officer in Minneapolis who tried to stop violence and was killed and left for dead, beloved by all, but not covered and celebrated by all because the wrong profession, I guess, wrong profession to be retired from, police officer, police captain. Those were real men, though. Heroic men, men of martial structure and virtue and valor. And there are so many more. We just focus on the wrong men perversely here. We focus on too many man children, man boys. Whether we take up the sword, the plow, the ball, the gavel, our children, or our Bibles, we must always do it like the men we are called to be, William Bennett wrote. Does anyone recall the My Turn column in Newsweek where interesting people in society wrote interesting essays? In 1977, William Bennett wrote one called Let's Bring Back Heroes. That was more than 40 years ago, and it still seems right to me. He wrote the following. As a child growing up in Brooklyn, New York, I had many heroes. The one I remember best was Gary Cooper as Marshall Will Kane in High Noon. I saw the movie when I was nine years old and 
Coop as well is still special to me. He wasn't the roughest, toughest guy in the world in the movie. His courage wasn't the macho man of Clint Eastwood's Dirty Harry or the man with no name. That was the stuff of his antagonists, the Miller brothers. Will was worth admiring for other things. In language I was to learn later for his courage and compassion and sense of what deserved to be loved and protected. In addition to Will, because my family and teachers thought it worth their time, I was exposed to a variety of other heroes and heroines. Lou Gehrig, Roy Campanella, Edmund Hillary, Tamsin Donner, Abraham Lincoln, Esther, Odysseus, and later on in college to Mother Courage and Socrates, Martin Luther King Jr. and Justice Holmes. In all of them, it is fair to say that there was a certain nobility of largeness, of soul, a hitching up of one's own purpose to larger purposes, to purposes beyond the self, to something that demanded endurance or sacrifice or courage or resolution or compassion. It was to nurture something because one had a sense of what deserved to be loved and preserved. From childhood through adolescence and into early adulthood, people went to the trouble of pointing out individuals who possessed qualities of human excellence and that were worth imitating and striving for. Eventually, we learned that heroes and their qualities were to be found even closer to home and that there were neighbors, friends, and even members of the family who possessed many of these qualities. 1977 again. In a recent survey of 1,200 junior high school children, the most popular response to the question, who is your hero? was nobody. Nobody. Other answers far down the line in this and other polls have revealed the devaluation of the hero, at least its devaluations, rock musicians, superstars in sports. This suggests in my own informal poll and the report of friends of mine who are teachers have confirmed my suspicions that heroes are out of fashion. For some reason, perhaps for no reason, many of us think it not proper to have heroes, or worse, that there aren't any, or only shabby ones. Such a fad is dangerous because it puts children's ideals, aspirations, and their notions of self-worth in jeopardy. Children need to know what deserves to be emulated and loved and nurtured, but knowing these things is not transmitted by the genes. These things must pass through education from generation to generation. C.S. Lewis didn't have the benefit of a poll, but he anticipated the results of this one when he remarked that the task of the modern educator is not to cut down jungles, but to irrigate deserts. We have been too much suckered by what is called the reality of technique, or the aha theory of human behavior. The aha theory assumes that the most real aspects of anything are those that are base and are concealed from the eye. Aha, you may, be a, you may appear to be an honest lawyer, but that is only a devi- devious approach to get business. Aha, teacher, you may appear to have an interest in my child, but you are merely putting me on in order to get me to tell the principal how fine you are so you can get a raise. Or the worst aha of all, aha, dad, you may try to make me believe that you're doing it for my good, but you're really just doing it to manipulate me and to show me you have power over me. Think about it. How is it that the worst somehow gains more reality than the best? How is it that baseness, insensitivity, callous indifference, hardness, sadism are more real than pride and honor and compassion and courage and sacrifice? Even if they are more prevalent, and I am not sure that they are, that just won't do. Reality doesn't depend on a majority vote. We have become so interested in raking muck that we scarcely lift our eyes from it. Whether it's a scandal in politics like Watergate or demythologizing or phony sophistication or believing that every good action has an ulterior and crass motive, the rise of the anti-hero and a variety of other forces have made the hero invisible to us. In 1950, in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, William Faulkner Faulkner mentioned mentioned with disdain authors who write not of the hearts but of the glands. He reminded his audience that the basest of all things is to be afraid and that the writer must leave no room in his workshop for anything but the old verities and truths of the heart, lacking which any story is ephemeral and doomed. Love and honor and pity and pride and compassion 
and sacrifice. He echoed Yeats's well-known prophecy about a time, perhaps our time, when ceremony of innocence is drowned and the best lack all conviction. It's hard to have convictions without ideals. Heroes instantiate ideals. Real heroes. Not the types with wires and robots and just because they may have a lot of money or a lot of fame. Maybe fictional or factual, real heroes are. As long as they embody character, as long as they possess qualities that we instantly recognize as true to human life and worthy of human attention. In education, rather than squabble for innovation on the one hand and return to basics on the other, we ought to encourage something that is both. An innovation and a return to the basics of aspiration. Along with emphasis on arithmetic and language, even perhaps variations on sociology, we should tell some stories, true stories about heroes. We should offer our students and ourselves some real examples, not only of human corruption, degradation, and duplicity, for that is all around us, but also of the qualities we think men and women can and should possess, the qualities that keep our culture and our community from succumbing to corruption, degradation, and duplicity. Every community, even Sodom and Gomorrah, had one individual in it who could be identified to students as worth admiring. This could be done even as students are taught to engage in the now honored practice of suspecting the motives of everyone else. I think the time taken for this exercise will be worth it, and it's possible that if we don't take the time, our children, taught as they have been to doubt, will live the consequences of not knowing what they may safely believe. Perhaps a good way to close here is with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In the world's broad field of battle, in the bivouac of life, be not like dumb, driven cattle. Be a hero in the strife. I'm Seth. We'll be right back. <laughs>